afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the People's Republic of Berkeley, California. Um, when I came here today, I saw a sign just as we got off on university that said, now leaving the United States of America. I think this is the first time we've done a Kaha event outside the actual country. My name is Lance Burrow. I'm the uh, Safe Sport Coordinator for uh, the California Amateur Hockey Association. I'm also a board of director on the board of directors, and I'm the uh, general counsel for the organization. I'm a practicing lawyer. I see some friends here, sometimes known as opposing counsel. And um, I'm also a recovering hockey dad. And um, I had a little bit of a slip when I saw Marie, are you here? You already left. She was my team manager a few years ago, and um, it's nice not to have her give a, have to give a check to her every other, every other week for money that I wish I could do other stuff with. But anyway, welcome to the Safe Sport program. Uh, let me make a few introductions. Everyone knows Steve Lang, our president. Uh, we call him El Jefe. And, and uh, this is Laura Kahn, our uh, Safe Sport Coordinator for Northern California. She's also Youth Chair Counsel, and I can't repeat what we call her. And this is Joyce Kopinski. Joyce is from USA Hockey. She is the Safe Sport Coordinator for USA Hockey, and she's going to share with us later on some of the proposed uh, changes to the Safe Sport Manual that will be coming out sometime soon. And it was interesting, yesterday, when we were in Orange County doing this program, by the way, completely different vibe down there, we did it in a bowling alley. This is much nicer. <laughs> yes, it was, Laura. <laughs> anyway, um, it was kind of interesting. Nobody knew who Joyce was there. She was sitting outside the room, and people were walking out saying, why, why do we have to listen to this safe sports stuff? I've already taken it online. And I know that's going through a few minds in here. Let me get a show of hands. How many people have our safe sport qualified by going on the website, looking and going, listening and doing all that sort of stuff? All right, good. Do I have any coaches in here? One, two, three, four. All right, and... Um, Team managers, assistant managers, that sort of thing. Locker room attendants, everybody should raise their hand. Everybody in here should be screened and for the most part, safe sport qualified. But this class is not to teach you about safe sport. We're gonna go over the safe sport program in detail to remind us all and because there's gonna be a test at the end. But today, one of the reasons that we are doing this is because I've decided and we've all decided that we need to have this conversation. Um, I've been going for the last three years to the USA Hockey Winter Meeting and um, the annual Congress. And every time that these meetings are, are, are had, we have all the safe sport coordinators from all over the country are there and we have lots of interesting discussions. One thing that comes out of this, though, is that <clears throat> the Safe Sport program is a really good program, but the people who wear the boots on the ground uh, need to have a discussion with each other about how we go about putting it into play. This is a big deal. So the first part of our program is going to be a reminder of what Safe Sport is about. Then we're going to talk about how we go about investigating claims. Then we're going to talk about Bylaw 10. Does everybody know what Bylaw 10 is? Okay, no hands. That's good. Tom, I would have expected <laughs> you to put your hand up because he's got it memorized. Yes. Bylaw 10 is the disciplinary um, procedures that are set out in the USA Hockey Bylaws. And it's how we go about the, the final stage of the Safe Sport program, and that is having disciplinary hearings metting out discipline and following up on it. It occurred to me when we first started doing Safe Sport about uh, three years ago that it was going to be a paradigm shift, if you will. It's going to change the culture of our sport. It's going to change the culture of youth sports. In fact, when we started talking about it, 
I got either figuratively or literally stink eye from a lot of people looking at me like, oh no, here's another thing we have to deal with. It's something I'll ignore too, but we can't do that. So, um, why safe sport? Here's some interesting information for you. Obviously, we have it to prevent known offenders from joining our program and deterring offenders that have not already been caught. How many of you know that there's child molesters out there in the world? Everybody knows it because we all watch the news at night. Um, it's also to protect our participants by creating an um, environment that puts the potential offender at risk and deters them from becoming involved. The reality is these offenders that we're talking about here, child molesters or whatever, 90% of them will get through a screening process. That, that's a statistic I'm going to talk about later on, but 90% of people who engage in that kind of behavior will pass a screening process like nobody's business. And the reason is, is they haven't been caught yet. And one of the reasons they haven't been caught yet is because they're very good at what they do. It's also to protect uh, the reputation of USA Hockey and its affiliates. Kaha, NorCal, Skaha, all of those groups and organizations. Um, and to make sure that those local organizations, the ones that you operate in almost on a daily basis, are safe. And it's to prevent negligence. It's to prevent liability. It's to prevent that opportunity for some um, fat cat civil trial lawyer to, to file a big lawsuit against us because of things happen. I want to tell you a cautionary tale. Most of you people may understand or have heard about this situation. This happened in Santa Clara County. A school teacher teaching in the third grade was molesting little girls. He was doing horrible things to them. He'd been screened. The school system had a program in place similar to Safe Sport that required uh, certain things to happen when complaints were made, one of which is mandatory reporting, which we'll be talking about. Somebody reported this guy to the school principal. She took it upon herself to investigate whether or not this was a credible complaint, decided not credible. He continued to molest children, little girls in particular, unspeakable things. It got to the point where somebody went outside the school system and went directly to the cops. He got investigated. As he was about to be arrested, the principal found out about uh, the police investigation and called him and warned him about it. Well, you can expect what happened. First off, he was removed from the environment. Kids were a little safer. He went to jail for a long time, and when and if he ever gets out, he'll be a registered sex offender for the rest of his life. The principal got charged with a crime and convicted for failing to uh, report this as a mandatory reporter. That's not bad enough. The verdict in the civil case was $15.5 million. That's a scary proposition. All of that would have been avoided, except maybe the conviction of the child molester, if they had followed the rules that they had in place and taken care of business. That's why we're here today. That's why we're here talking. Now, I don't want to be uh, somebody who's going to scare you to death, because if we follow our, our protocols and do our jobs, we're going to protect ourselves from 90% of this stuff. Here's some statistics. Before age of 18, 6 to 13% of competitive athletes experience some form of assault within, sexual abuse or assault within their sport. That's as many as one out of every eight. Does that surprise you? That's a shocking number. How many kids on a team? 20? Two or three of them, statistically. How many kids in a program? A whole lot. I was not aware of that statistic until I got involved in safe sport. That's a sobering number. 80% of college athletes report that they've witnessed or experienced some form of hazing. That shouldn't surprise anybody in here who has the same color hair I do, because when I was 
participating in sports. And sadly, when I started coaching low these many years ago, hazing was not only a part of the sport, it was kind of required. That's how, you, that's how we thought in those days. We thought we got, report, we got a, a better performance out of people. The most reported form of misconduct, emotional misconduct, increases as athletes move up the competitive um, ladder. Many as 75% of elite athletes reporting, uh, are reporting that their coaches emotionally abuse them during their athletic career. That should be a sobering number too. That's 80% that's of people that play elite sports. How many folks do we have in here that are involved in the tier program? That's your guys. That's your players. Uh, this is another reason that we need to stop and, and take a, um, a look at safe sport. Children know their abusers 90% of the time. Big number. Scary. It happens in the home. It happens where children congregate, um, youth organizations, schools teams, that sort of thing. It's another reason that we have to have safe sport. Approximately one third of all child sexual abuse occurs at the hands of females. Who's surprised by that number? I, I was absolutely surprised by that. Um, just recently in the news, we had a um, football cheerleader, a professional football cheerleader just got convicted of rape of a, of a young man. Approximately one-third of all sexual misconduct is committed by minors. That's scary. That means that in your organizations, this can happen, and it can happen very easily. Criminal background checks and sexual offender registries only identify people who have a criminal record. A check won't catch 90% of those people. So we can go through all of the screening processes that we want to, and 90% of those people don't get caught. But you know what? They don't come into our ice rinks and they don't come into our organization because we have a safe sport program that works. And they know it, and they'll go somewhere else. Everybody has seen the safe sport wheel. It's the uh, six-point prong. Policies, education, screening, reporting, responding, and disciplining. And that's what we're going to go over today in some detail. If I had some better skills at computers, I would have put the new uh, USA Hockey website page on. <laughs> uh, this one kind of makes my stomach turn because I hated this uh, website with a passion. How many of you have been to the new website? Much easier to use, much nicer to follow, and there's a lot of good stuff on there. We're going to talk about some of it later. So our policies and procedures actually police and uh, prohibit certain types of conduct. Sexual abuse, physical abuse, and emotional abuse. Bullying, threats, and harassment, and hazing. Um, we have an effective program of managing our hockey environment. We have locker room policies. Everybody in here been a locker room monitor at least one time in their life? Fun, huh? Why anybody would want to go inside a locker room is beyond me. But we have to be there and we have to be ready. Electronics communications policy. Does everyone deal with this in your hockey environment in some fashion? You know, in, in our world today, all of those uh, interesting social media things like Twixter and Fakebook and Snapchat and what's the other one, Inst Instascam and all that stuff are, in, are involved in our environment and we have to deal with them. And we'll talk some about this later on. Travel policy. If you have tier teams that travel to those states that start with an M beginning in next month, you have a written travel policy in your program, right? Yes, have to have a written travel policy. We'll talk about that in some detail. A billeting policy. Now, um, is there anybody in here that has a, pro has a team that has billeted kids on it? 
I, I think the Sharks might, you know. Well, on the tier, tier two teams, tier three, uh, tier one teams, excuse me, um, usually have a, have a billeting policy because that, that requires certain things to happen. But you got to have one. If you have billets in your program, this usually applies to junior hockey and, and tier one teams, you got to have a billet policy. We're going to talk about it. Okay, well, let's talk about the sexual abuse policy. This perhaps prohibits sexual abuse of any, underscore any, bold any, participant. That means the players, the minors, and the adults. They all come under the purview of this problem. Sexual conduct between children can be abusive uh, if significant disparity in age, development, size, or intellectual capacity. The point of this is you may have two children that are involving in some sort of sexual behavior that are both minors. And the point of this is, is that there's usually that disparity in, in uh, power. One child may be a youth coach. One child may be the team captain. That sort of thing. And that's, that's why you have to be, that's what you have to be aware of in this regard. Neither consent of a minor, mistake as to age, nor fact that contact occurred outside of hockey are defenses uh, to a complaint. That makes sense, right? We all know, because we watch criminal uh, shows on TV, criminal justice or whatever, that if you're a minor, you can't give consent. So that's not an excuse, it's not a defense. A mistake is to age. I, I thought she was 18. Doesn't fly. There's still a minor. And whether or not that contact occurred outside of hockey um, shouldn't be um, something that stops us from looking into it, particularly, well, particularly when it involves two people that um, came together because of hockey. So you might have two people participating in, on your team and they're having something completely unrelated, but the connection is hockey. We still have to deal with that as a complaint. And sexual abuse may occur between adults if non-consensual, coerced, or manipulated. Can anybody tell me how that might happen? People in Southern California honed right in on it. This, this is the situation where somebody may be awarding sexual favors so that Junior can play on the power play, or get more ice time, or be the number one goalie, that sort of thing. And if you don't think that happens in the wide world of hockey, you, you, you need to think again. So we just completely stop that kind of behavior from happening. It's not part of our program, even between consenting adults, particularly where it's being coerced or manipulated. Physical abuse policy prohibits physical abuse of any participant in our programs. Again, any, underscore any. Coaches, uh, parents, and uh, players. Uh, safe sport coordinators are exempted from that because we get abused all the time. It includes physical conduct that causes or has potential to cause harm or creates the threats of bodily harm. You don't have to actually touch somebody to physically abuse them. If you scare them, um, if you do something, uh, the lawyers in this room know the difference between assault and battery, but either one of those applies as physical abuse. This includes throwing or threatening to throw objects or sports equipment. Bobby Knight would not be welcome in our ice rinks because he seems to like to throw furniture. Also includes providing alcohol uh, or drugs to minor participants. Do you believe that that happens in our wonderful sport? It does. And I, actually, we have a hypothetical at the end of the program that's absolutely true that will surprise you and hopefully shock you because it involves mites. That's a tease. Physical um, abuse does not include, and this is important, physical contact that is reasonably designed to coach, teach, demonstrate, or improve hockey skills. 
including physical conditioning, team building, and appropriate discipline. This is a nuanced definition because there is a fine line. You know, back in the old days, you, well, who remembers the scene from The Miracle on Ice where um, Herbie Brooks had his uh, team bag skate back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. That was acceptable back then. It may fall within this definition. We can have a discussion over cocktails later on. But if you're on a mic team and, you're back, and you see the coach bag skating your kids until they drop or puke in a bucket, that's probably physical abuse. Not probably, it is. Emotional abuse involves a pattern, pattern of deliberate non-contact behavior that has the potential to cause emotional or psychological harm to a participant. Can anybody give me an example of what I just defined? Yes, ma'am. Right. Screaming at a child for the purpose of putting them um, at a disadvantage. Now, there is a place in all sports for yelling, but there's a difference between the productive type of yelling or the dangerous type of yelling. We're going to talk about this later on. It uh, may be verbal acts, physical acts, or acts that deny attention or support. I think that's what she's talking about. You yell at a, a child and put him on the end of the bench and don't let him play, you're probably emotionally abusing him. You're really pissing off his mom and dad, too, by the way, if you didn't know that already. Examples include a pattern of verbal abuse or physical aggressive be behavior, such as throwing equipment, water bottles, or chairs, or punching walls, windows, or other objects. Can you imagine coaches doing that? Who's ever seen that in their career? We all have. Again, Bobby Knight is not welcome as a coach in our organization. And here's the nuanced exception. This does not include generally accepted and age-appropriate coaching methods of skill enhancement, physical conditioning, motivation, team building, appropriate discipline, or improving athletic performance. There is a difference. You know it when you see it. It's kind of hard to describe. It may be age-appropriate. You know, you don't uh, yell at mites and squirts the same way you yell at 18-year-old players because they need different levels of motivation. Bullying, threats, and harassment policy. Bullying involves a pattern, again a pattern, of physical or non-physical behaviors intended to cause fear, humiliation, or harm in an attempt to exclude someone. We all know what bullies are. There's any number of viral videos on YouTube that shows what happens when people bully. The actual effect of this is kids kill themselves. We all have heard that story. It's happened in all of our communities. That's why we don't want to prevent, uh, that we want to prevent bullying and harassment. Threats involve any written, verbal, physical, or electronic transmitted expression of intent to harm. Again, Facebook, emails, YouTube. We had a situation in Southern California recently where uh, two teams played. One uh, defenseman on one team put a hip check um, into a 16-year-old player that uh, sent him back to the third grade. It was an absolutely fair beautiful hip check, but the other team took umbrage at it, and before the night was over, emails were going back and forth, Facebook posts, Snapchat, all that stuff was going on, and there was a threat made. Next time we play you, you guys are in for it. It was a little more graphic than that. Fortunately, adults found out about it and, and stopped it, but that's the kind of things that happen in our culture today. Harassment involves a pattern of physical, non-physical behaviors that are intended to cause fear, humiliation, or annoyance. Um, certain types of, of uh, there's also includes sexual harassment and includes situations where we demean people because of who they are or what they are, sexual orientation, 
race, gender, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and it can sometimes be seen in situations where a coach or someone will withhold something like playing time or that thing based on, say, sexual orientation. Coaches and other adults cannot ignore and must act. This is a significant change in, in uh, our, our sport in the way that all of the adults that administer it um, are required to act. Coaches, team managers, administrators, if you see some of this behavior happening, you can no longer turn a blind eye. You have to do something. That's probably the best thing that's come out of safe sport. It requires you to do that. Failing to do that makes another safe sport violation that's directed at the coach or person who failed to do that. Hazing policy includes any conduct which is intimidating, humiliating, offensive, or physically harmful. How many of you folks in here remember uh, joining an organization, whether it was a team or, or a um, fraternity or sorority, in which you had to go through a little bit of hazing? It's happened to everybody. And that probably didn't make you feel good. Coaches, if you go into a locker room and see somebody have a, a tape on their mouth and they're in their underwear being, being doused with cold water and made to eat raw liver, I think you're watching somebody being hazed. We have to stop this. How many hockey folks in here have participated in locker boxing in the past? You can go ahead, it's happened to everybody. That's a form of hazing. It's typically an activity that serves to include someone in, in a group, which makes it more difficult to deal with. Examples include requiring or forcing the consumption of alcohol or drugs the college fraternity or sorority, perhaps. Physical restraint, sexual simulations, social actions, grossly inappropriate or provocative clothing. <laughs> kind of reminds me of when my son played uh, youth hockey in Iowa. They had a tradition on their team that all the rookies had to dress up like girls and uh, be taken out to dinner by the, um, in a public place by, by the, the older guys on the team. Now, I have to say, my son really looked good, but today they probably couldn't do that. Locker boxing is also a form of hazing. I just said that earlier. Um, that should not be going on anymore. Does everybody know what locker boxing is? Boy, you know a lot. What is it? Uh, right, they usually put a helmet on. Right. They put their helmets on, hopefully a mouthpiece in, and they put bo boxing gloves on and just wail on each other. Fortunately, you know, we have a concussion policy to deal with the aftermath of that, but we shouldn't be dealing with locker boxing anymore. That's a form of hazing. A person's consent to participate does not mean it's not hazing. Most people want to join the group. They want to be part of the cool people. So they'll go through this process, but it's hurtful. Hazing does not include group or team activities, again, that are meant to establish normative team behaviors or promote team cohesion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So long as they don't have a reasonable potential to cause emotional or physical distress. Any questions so far? Locker room policy. I would like somebody, somebody in here from the Blackhawks? I'm going to pick on people I know. What's your locker room policy? Uh, you're pointing to, I saw a raise hand. <laughs> okay, so essentially she says two adults uh, have to be in the locker room and, not, and you can't be in there by yourself as an adult and, and a whole bunch of other things and that's a good locker room policy. It, it exceeds that which is required by USA Hockey. Uh, by the way, locker room supervision is one of the most critical elements to reduce the risk of safe sport problems. Most, most of our safe sport issues arise out of the locker room. Interesting, interesting. Requires at least one properly screened adult. This is the USA Hockey Standard. Properly screened and 
safe sport qualified adult. At lower age groups, numerous adults may be present. And USA Hockey recognizes that younger teams um, uh, have a need for their parents to be, or younger players have a need for their parents to be in the locker room. So mites and squirts, they're, and this is up to the club, but that's probably not inappropriate for those, those parents to be allowed to help them put their skates on. If you have an 18 AAA player who still needs help putting his skates on, he's got a problem. Uh, teams may prohibit parents in the lop locker room subject to common sense, and this, of course, depends on the age. Um, did you have a question? Okay, just trying to stay awake? Me too. Um, it depends on the age, um, and um, it would probably be inappropriate to ban adults from locker rooms when they're little, uh, when by the time they're 18 years old, who would want to go in there anyway? I did once and I'm still having problems. Avoid situations where an adult is alone, alone with minor participants. This is a, a key point to interacting with your players. It doesn't just involve being in the locker room. If a coach is known to counsel his players one-on-one, -on -one, um, he needs to have that policy of his looked at because this is where we get in trouble. You should never have a coach one-on-one -on -one with a player or a minor. The uh, other adult, say it's an assistant coach or somebody else like that, is there basically to be a witness in the event that somebody says something. <laughs> Cell phones and recording devices and cameras may not be used in the locker room. That's probably part of your locker room, Becky, isn't it? Yeah. And this is still a problem. We still see from time to time somebody in a celebratory mode in a locker room taking pictures of kids, doing whatever they do in there. And if they're in various states address, it's a real problem. Um, we're going to talk about this with one of our hypotheticals later on, but your coaches should have strict rules about cell phones and recording devices, cameras and whatnot in the locker room. Well, this doesn't mean a coach can't take his iPad in there if he's using it to, to coach. But common sense really has to be applied here. Each local program shall publish their specific locker room policy. If you're in a program that does not have a written locker room policy, somebody has to have a chat with the president of that organization because you have to have one. It's part of the deal. Coaches and team administrators are responsible for compliance with locker room supervision requirements. Coaches are responsible for everything that goes on in their team. Believe it or not, this is one of those things. It's not just on the ice. You're responsible for um, your score sheets. You're responsible for the playing rules. You're responsible for safe sport. All that stuff that you guys learned about this morning in the other room, coaches are actually responsible for that, even though they didn't attend that program. With co-ed teams, both female and male privacy rights must be given consideration and appropriate arrangements made. It's not acceptable for persons to be observing the opposite gender while they dress. How many people have co-ed teams? Does your locker room policy um, have something in it about how you handle the locker room with co-ed players? It has to. Everybody, all the girls go in and change, they go out, the guys go in and change, they go out, everybody goes in and has their pregame meeting and then you leave the same way. Very simple. It should be in writing. That's, that's absolutely correct. Um, that's, and that's the USA Hockey standard, and I think, Joyce, you're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, they have to... No, she got three stars, Laura. Wow. <laughs> well, so I don't have people in the locker room. That's fine. Okay. That's fine. Now, with little kids, you might want to do that. Sure. But with the older players, you might not want to do that. But the <laughs> locker room monitor... Locker room monitors have to be within, I would say, an arm's length so that they can hear what's going on. You know, if the music stops for any length of time, you might want to stick your head in. Yes, ma'am, did you have a question? Yeah, if you have an all-boys team. It, it is a problem. 
and we've actually had to deal with this a few times. Um, at a certain age, moms should not be going into the locker room on all boy teams at all. Pardon me? Three. <laughs> no. No, I really think that with squirts and, and um, mites and maybe peewees too, but after that, once they become bantams and, you know, their voices start to change and weirdness happens, moms really don't belong in there. And if they want to go in there, uh, I'll, I'll be happy to talk to them. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Why would you do that? <laughs> the question was, if you're a female coach and you coach a boys team, how do you deal with that? Carefully. Um, I think you have to modify your locker room behavior, something along the lines of a co-ed uh, um, locker room, so that they, maybe you have the team captain come tell you when everyone um, has their uh, equipment on so that then you can go in and have your locker room talk and vice versa. And by the way, you get four stars. <laughs> Any more questions about locker rooms? All right. Electronic communications are often used to bully, threaten, or harass other participants. We know that. We see it all the time. I just gave you an example earlier. Use of various forms of electronic communications increases the possibility for improprieties and misunderstandings. It also provides potential offenders with unsupervised and potentially inappropriate access to players. That's scary. Doing something on Facebook, most kids don't you know, tighten up their um, access to Facebook, that there's people out there that troll that stuff. Um, so you gotta have a good policy that prevents this kind of stuff from happening. Communications involving participants should be appropriate, productive, and transparent. Let's face it, no coach should send one-on-one -on -one emails, texts, snack chats or whatever to one player. If you communicate with one player, you communicate with all of them in the same way. If you've got coaches in your organization that resist that, they need to have, they need to be here to talk to us. Um, if the players are under the age of 18, you have to send the same email to mom and or dad. One of the parents has to get that email. It's being transparent. It's not leaning into the left hook that you might not see coming. Social media should be used for communicating team act uh, activities, not personal. Yes, ma'am. Well, again, we're overriding with common sense. I'm more concerned about the coach sending out information uh, that affects the whole team or, and maybe has one player that he or she communicates with more. That's just asking for trouble. And at the older level, you know, on an 18 AAA team, most of your kids are going to be 18 years old anyway. And guess what? Big shock. Surprises me, but they're adults. Any content of an electronic communication should be readily available to share with the public or families of the player or coach. It's kind of what I just said. If the player is under the age of 18, uh, they must be sent to the players. Again, transparency. You don't put anything in an email or a text or a Facebook post that you wouldn't want the Pope to see. And, and, and you'll never go wrong. Travel policy. Um, we got some A and B folks in here. And most of the time you travel like to Stockton or somewhere like that. But once in a while, at least once a year, you probably uh, have your team pack all their stuff up and get on an airplane and fly to a state that starts with M to go to a, a, a tournament of some sort. If you do, a travel policy uh, equal to an equivalent of that with a tier program applies to you too. Um, local travel, um, well, I'll get that in a minute. Minor players are most vulnerable to abuse during travel. 
Adherence to travel policies helps reduce opportunities for misconduct. Local travel should be the responsibility of parents, not teams. And this is where our screening and safe, book, safe sport kind of run into each other. If you have um, a practice of one or two parents driving some of the kids in the van when you go to Fresno or Santa Rosa and you're a travel team, and that person isn't screened and safe sport qualified, you're asking for trouble. They have to be. Anyone, the key word is frequent contact with children, has to be screened and has to be safe sport qualified. Everybody do that, follow that rule, needs to be done. Teams should provide adequate supervision and chaperones. Whether it's a day trip or it's a trip to a state that starts with M. You have to have chaperones and these people again, screened, safe sport qualified. Drivers should have driving records checked. Happens when they get screened. And if you have somebody driving your team members that hasn't been screened, you, you've got a problem. So we just don't do that. Coaches and volunteers should avoid driving alone with an unrelated minor. Believe it or not, this happens. Hey, I'll pick Johnny up and I'll take him to practice. And if there isn't Johnny and Jimmy and Bob in the car with him, he's asking for trouble. He's leaning into the left hook that he can't see coming. This is just like having a counseling session with your children. Somebody else, adult, has to be there. Coaches should never share a hotel room with an unrelated minor. That would never happen, right? Not, not, well, it does happen. It shouldn't happen anymore. Hotel rooms should be monitored and checked regularly by screened adults. Tier folks who travel to those other states on a regular basis, this has become, I mean, de rigueur. This happens all the time. We have to do this. There should be cooperation with family regarding telephone calls, family in same hotels, distribution of travel itineraries. Um, a coach friend of mine, who probably none of you know, so I'm going to say his name, John Ballou, learned this lesson the hard way. And it's kind of funny. John decided that cell phones were a pariah to his team, so he took them all to pick them up at night and hand them out in the next morning. Well, hockey players are not stupid. At 2.35 that morning, the phones all went off at one time. <laughs> so John changed his policy to make sure that he turned them all the way off. But that's actually a good policy. He picked the phones up, and, and, and so they weren't a distraction. At the same time, John does have a policy of, with the parents. He tells them, hey, if you need to get a hold of your ch child between this time and this time, call me. And it works really well. But you've got to have that kind of a program. No coach or chaperone shall be under the influence of alcohol or drugs while performing their duties. This makes sense. Some of you may want to be under the influence of alcohol during the performance of these duties, but you can't be. Now, this doesn't mean that after the, the Bantam team is tucked in, uh, the coaches can't go down and have a beer or, or two before they tuck themselves in. But while they're actively doing what they're supposed to be doing, alcohol, drugs, of course, goes without saying prohibited. Billeting policy. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, uh, that, that's, and I'm glad you brought this up because I forgot to tell you another aspect of these travel policies that is not readily apparent and has already got one coach in the south in a little bit of hot water. It is the policy of USA, USA Hockey that if a parent desires to travel with the team and have his child or her child stay in the room with them as opposed to, you know, in the room with all the rest of the other players, that's absolutely allowed. And it cannot be, um, example, we had a coach down south that decided that his policy was, no, my, my Bantam players are going to have to learn to live together in, in the same environment. And uh, one mother objected to that because her child was young and hadn't done it before. And she says, I'll pay for my own room. I want my son to stay with me. And the coach said, here's your release. That's uh, uh, forbidden. You cannot do that. In fact, 
um, that's, it was interesting to uh, have that discussion with the coach because he kept telling me he's the coach of the team. He gets to set the rules. And this is why we're having this discussion. There are still coaches out there that think their rules trump anything that the USA Hockey says. And the Safe Sport program is, is absolutely must be followed. Yes, ma'am. But, but I don't know that that's a hardcore policy of USA Hockey. Uh, again, common sense. Um, if they're put to bed, it doesn't mean you can't have a glass of wine with dinner or something like that. If you're blotto, uh, maybe you shouldn't be chaperoning your, your children. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that, that's actually a, a good policy. Um, the designated uh, driver policy. In other words, one coach decides I'm not going to get hammered tonight. Um, I'm, I'm using humor to make an emphasis here. Um, that's a good policy to do as well. Uh, hopefully, uh, once they're tucked in bed at night, um, there's not going to be a need for a level three paramedic to come and visit them. But you never know. Any more questions about travel policies? Billeting policy primarily exists, again, like I said earlier, junior and tier one uh, level. All adults in billeted homes must be screened. California, how is it an adult defined? Anyone over the age of 18. So if you've got a 16-year-old player billeting in your home and you've got an 18-year-old um, son who's going to college and doesn't play hockey, he has to be screened and he has to take the safe sport program or you can't bill it there. Programs should have published rules and regulations for the billeting arrangement. It has to be agreed to by parents and billets and players. This involves how much you're going to pay on a, on a monthly basis. It may involve uh, curfew hours, that sort of thing. But everyone has to agree to it. Teams as well as host family have rules and curfews that must be followed. When we've had billeted kids, there was always a curfew. And uh, how do you think that curfew was, was enforced? Two ways. We as the billeting family did that. Sometimes the coach would make a phone call. And the coaches, again, learned real quick because it was John Ballou not to call on a cell phone. The, the kid had to be accessible by a landline at the residence as part of the curfew problem. And these are just the real interesting little issues you get into with this kind of stuff. If you have billeted players in your program, you should have a billet coordinator, somebody who is designated as such that needs to be screened and safe sport qualified. I'm going to go through this real quick. Education awareness uh, training provides our members with information necessary to follow, uh, to, to take uh, part in, in the safe sport and to make sure it works effectively. Awareness training is not expensive. In fact, it's free. All you have to do is go on the website, sign up as a volunteer, and then you can access the, the, the Safe Sport program. Um, by the way, sitting in here, if you haven't been screened, is not going to qualify you for Safe Sport. You still have to go and sit through that program. It's a little bit different than what we're talking about today. <coughs> this training was originally produced by the USOC. I'm going to explain later on how we relate to the USOC. Um, and remember that safe sport policies require training for those that have regular, routine, frequent uh, access to or supervision over youth participants. Big definition. They're responsible for enforcing child abuse and misconduct policies, are in managerial or supervisory roles, and are employees or volunteers. Coaches, assistant coaches, youth coaches, team managers, locker room attendants, Everybody in, in, in the officer position in your organization, all of these folks have to be safe sport qualified. And at least one person from each program must uh, complete training by November 30th. Uh, um, Joyce is going to talk about that later. I want to get down to, I, I don't think we need to talk about screening. It's become just part of our Reporting of concerns of abuse. An effective reporting policy 
has to be implemented that results in reports of suspected abuse and misconduct, does not in any way deter victims or witnesses from reporting abuse and misconduct. It's a key to this program. Potential abusers will avoid programs that have a vibrant reporting aspect to it. There are several ways you can make a report about uh, a safe sport a complaint. You can go to the USA Hockey website and follow the bouncing ball to get to the point where you can report it there. You can uh, call um, safe sport at that number there, which is Joyce. It's answers right on her desk and uh, she will answer the phone and tell you what to do, or you can send an email. You can also report a safe sport complaint to Steve, to me, to Laura, uh, to anyone on the board of directors. Um, that's the, how important this is. And we man our phones 24-7, and uh, we will respond to these. Um, what I just said. All cases involving suspicions or allegations of child, physical or sexual abuse must be reported to the appropriate law enforcement authorities. This is called mandatory reporting. Um, let me get down to that. Uh, if you have any questions at all, you can go to this uh, www.childwelfare.gov. And there's a bunch of information on there that would be helpful, but this is our mandatory reporting statute in California. I'm not going to read it in its entirety, but it identifies who is a mandatory reporter. Teachers, medical personnel, police officers, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we get down to and individuals providing services to minor children. That's us. We are mandatory reporters. This means that we don't think we don't do, if somebody reports to you, child, abuse, physical or sexual, you shall report it to the police immediately. Don't stop and pass go and collect $200 and think about whether somebody made a legitimate complaint or not. You call the cops and let them sort it out. That's what they do. Failure to do that, emphasis on penal code section. If you don't do that, Tracy's going to have somebody come knock on your door. Tracy's a prosecutor. You're going to get charged with a crime. That's not fun. Mandatory reporting is very important, and we still have people in, in our state and throughout the country that don't get this. They don't understand how important it is. It's, not, um, it's, it's a bright line. You, there's no gray here. Responding to reports of abuse. Safe sport does not create a new disciplinary program. We'll talk about bylaw 10 later on. But we're gonna go over how we go about investigating these cases and how we triage who's gonna do the investigation. Um, and we also have a program set up by um, the bylaw 10 to deal with discipline. I'm gonna talk about that later on. This is important to remember that coaches are the first line of responsibility here. They're the first ones to see most of this stuff happen. Uh, okay, I'm gonna ask Joyce to uh, talk about the um, proposed changes to the manual and then we'll take a short break. All right? I'm going to come over here, give you guys a new angle to look at uh, while Lance is getting set up. So I know all of you have read the Safe Sport Handbook cover to cover, know it by heart, and so we're, we have some proposed changes uh, that we hope will be, we anticipate they'll be passed this September by the Executive Committee. Um, and these changes have come about with discussions with our Safe Sport coordinators and with leaders of USA Hockey programs about what changes they thought would should be made based on you know the last two seasons that we've had running the program as well as um, the audit we had, uh, USA Hockey was audited by the US Olympic Committee our safe sport program was as well as other NGB safe sport programs so then we had recommendations from them as well for our handbook 
Um, so the first one, one of the things we did, we wanted to include that conduct that is prohibited and regulated by the playing rules is not covered by the Safe Sport Program and should be addressed by playing rules. So we've gotten several calls that have come in where you know, there's a dangerous play on the ice or a penalty was missed, there's poor officiating, uh, there was an intent to injure type play on the ice during a game, and that should really be addressed by playing rules. So we just wanted to spell it out here. Uh, it's in our introduction section there. Um, so again, sorry, I'm repeating myself. So that would be covered by playing rules, and so Safe Sport would not be investigating those. Uh, next, we're gonna include in our definition of participants that Persons that are not registered, but who have regular routine and frequent access, or that are in a supervisory role of member programs, would also be included in this definition of participant. So a goalie coach or a guest coach that comes out or a board member, while they might not necessarily be registered with USA Hockey, they're still heavily involved in the program, and so they would fall under our jurisdiction for safe sport purposes. Uh, next, in the sexual, mis sexual abuse and misconduct section, we added language um, that prohibited sexual misconduct includes romantic or sexual relationships between adults, between athletes or other participants, and those that have direct supervisory or evaluative control or are in a position of power or trust over the athlete or participant. So this does not include relationships where it can be demonstrated that there is no imbalance of power. Uh, we did not originally have this in our handbook language, but we were required to add it by the US Olympic Committee. Uh, we didn't originally have it because we have a lot of youth programs, and this usually doesn't come up in our programs. Um, however, like our national teams or junior teams might have this issue come up with a coach that's 25 and a player that's 18. So that kind of relationship would be prohibited. However, if there's an pre-existing relationship, that would not be covered under this section. This is not where it would apply. So I skate on a women's team and my, one of our teammates, her husband's gonna coach our team. That's totally okay. Or you're, if you're in an adult league and you wanna date another adult league player, that's totally fine because there's no imbalance of power. Um, then next in the physical abuse section, we added language again to reinforce that rough play or anything that would occur during a game on the ice would not be considered a safe sport violation and would be addressed under the playing rules. And we also reiterated that in our bullying section. Uh, in, the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the emotional abuse section, we clarified that a single incident of yelling or throwing an item while is inappropriate and could justify review and disciplinary action would not be considered emotional abuse unless there's a pattern that is established. Um, again, as Lance mentioned early, our locker room policy, a lot of the reports that come in, incidents occur because there's a lack of locker room supervision. So here we just wanted to emphasize how important it is. So we added language that says all USA hockey programs must have at least one responsible screened adult present monitoring the locker room. And that if the locker room monitor is outside, that the monitor has to be in the immediate vicinity. And we added language that says near the door or within arm's length of the door. And we've had several situations come up where they said they had a monitor, but the monitor just went to put their kid's stuff in the car and came back and something happened, or you know, went to check on another locker room that they were also in charge of, or something happened in that time, short time frame, but that's when something happened. So we really wanted to emphasize how important that is. Um, in the training section, we do have some updates. Um, some of us just clean up. Our, the first year we have the handbook, we state, you know, in the 2013-14 season, this was required, and so we just kind of clean that up so it's current, it's the 2015-16 season and what the requirements are. In the coaches section for training, we did add that the training shall be completed prior to that coach's participation on ice or off the ice in the USA Hockey program. Uh, last year was the first year that we required safe sport training, and so some affiliates did extend the deadline for training to 1231. Uh, so this changes that for coaches. We did have 90% of our coaches completed last season, so we don't think it will be that much of an issue this season to have the training in place prior to participation. It would really only affect new coaches, or um, if a coach did take it in 2013 and 14, 
they have the refresher course that's available this season and that's a lot shorter, that's about 35 minutes. And so we thought this would be a good time to make that change and that would be the best practice to have them trained and screened prior to participation. There's also a note in the training se section that there's a parent training course that is available on the USOC training site. Uh, we have set it up that if you follow our instructions that you really are directed to the course that you need to take. So you log in, you have your confirmation number and it should direct you to either, hey, I need the refresher course or I need the training course or you're okay. Um, however, there is the parent course that's available, but we just wanted to state that that would not satisfy our training requirement for coaches, officials, or volunteers. Uh, in the reporting section, we added language about conflicts of interest. So we explained that anyone that is closely affiliated or may have a potential bias in an investigation or outcome of a complaint shall be recused from participating in the investigation or disciplinary process. Investigating Investigators or hearing panel members must be reasonably disinterested and impartial. Um, so sometimes I'll get a call or an email and they, they wanna make a complaint about someone and then in that email or call they'll say, and I'm not really sure, I don't think the local safe sport person can be unbiased because they're really good friends with this person I'm reporting. And so just to eliminate that as an issue, since there's a perceived bias by this person that person should be removed from handling the investigation or being on a hearing, hearing panel. Um, additionally, we have language that states that safe sport investigations or hearings regarding allegations of safe sport violations shall not consider or address any liability or responsibility in a financial or contractual dispute. So that's another issue we've had where someone will call or email and say, I wanna make this safe sport claim and by the way, we wanna remove this player from the program and we think we should get a release. We think we should get a refund of money. We don't wanna pay the remaining dues for the season. Uh, those are two separate issues. So if there is a safe sport allegation, we will investigate and handle the safe sport allegations. Um, but the financial or release contract situation is totally separate and that would be between the parent, the player and the program. And last we have, um, there's a US Center for Safe Sport that we hope will be opening either fourth quarter of this year or early next year. And this would be a third party entity that would handle claims of sexual abuse and misconduct. So it's the US Olympic Committee together with other NGBs that are working on the structure for this organization. And the reason that it would, they would handle these sexual abuse claims is that these are obviously the most difficult to investigate and we can get a lot of press about a situation and potentially negative press about it if it's not handled properly. And so the legislation is that any reports or claims that deal with sexual misconduct would go to this US Center for Safe Sport and we would be addressed by bylaw 10. Um, so we, this ent entity would really create independence and expertise in this area. We had a situation this past season uh, that was really difficult to investigate. We had uh, the police, it was reported to the police and there are a lot of red flags about this person. Um, the police didn't have enough to charge this person but also let us know that we don't think this person should really be around youth. And so we did our own investigation and a lot of our initial witnesses kind of stepped down and we didn't have as much evidence as we thought we would have. Uh, so they did settle prior to a hearing and it just really brought to light how difficult these cases are and so having this Steve's laughing at me because he's familiar with it. Um, it just really brought to light how difficult these cases are. And so having the center would create independence and would really alleviate, alleviate that responsibility from our coordinators. That is all I have. So we can go to break and I can be done being up here. Is this my good side? Thank you. If there's any questions, oh wait, do we have a question or are you just stretching? There should be, if you're working with USA Hockey and you're screened at our national level, that should only be happening every two years. Um, your affiliate screen would be separate, so I understand that. There was talk of a national screen. Um, initially, it was gonna be for officials. And then there's a Pennsylvania law that came out this past April, I think it was, April, May. Legislation came out and it was effective mid-July for Pennsylvania where they, their volunteers have to subject, like basically the volunteer is responsible for getting fingerprinted and screened and showing this information to their organization. And so it kind of threw a wrench 
in our plans, but we are still looking at that potentially down the road to have a national level screen. Yes, that is not currently. We are working, so what would happen, we do have one of our affiliates that is working with that right now, so what would happen is that, you know, I can talk to Steve or, you know, whatever screening company that, say, California uses would have to be okay with releasing that information to our, have it talk to our database, and then it would upload to our database, and then it, that screen, that actual check mark would be an accurate reflection of a, a person's being screened or not. So it is a possibility, um, you know, we can, I can talk to Steve more and, you know, work with our program and see if that's a possibility with the company that California uses and it is, okay. So then it would be talking to our database. So I can talk to them more about that and see where it would be at with that. No, um, so safe sport training is valid for two seasons. Um, which is, it's, there's kind of a wrench because our, they opened up registration April 1st. So if someone takes, so say if I'm new and I, registration just opened this April 1st and I register and I take my safe board training May 1st of 2015, I would be valid for this 2015-16 season and for the 16-17 season. So then in eight, the 15, 16, 16, 17, 17, 18 season, I would take the refresher course and that would be good for another two seasons. Okay, so I don't know if you heard the question, it was about penalty box attendance and whether they need to be screened and trained. And so we would really leave that up to the local programs or associations if they wanna have that at a level, you can certainly require that they take the training and our background checked. Um, we also. USA Hockey, that, has, that question has come up, and since they are in a public place and the amount of time that they would be able to interact with the youth is really limited, and again, in a public place, we would not require that. But you can, you can, the program certainly can enforce stricter requirements.